Hey guys, Martin King here, SkillTradeRescue.com. Today, uh, I have a treat for us. I got John Isaacson, he's on the line, and I've been excited about getting him on the show because he is a published author, and he, in a lot of ways, is going down a road that, um, that I wanna go eventually. Uh, he's got a new book out, and I just I just love how uh, pithy his how he how he talks about stuff. So this one, here you go. You ready? The the title of his book is How to Suck Less at Estimating. Yes, I said that right. <laughs> and John, hey man, welcome to the show, and uh, I'm I'm really happy to have you here, man. Thank you, Martin. Um, I, you know, on the book, uh, someone texted me, they went to Amazon cause they couldn't quite remember the name. So they started typing in how to suck <laughs> and quite an interesting, oh. uh, menu of options came up. So one of them was like how to suck a goat. And I'm thinking, you know, this particular gentleman was like, I'm looking for how to suck less at estimating and all these weird things pop up. I'm thinking how many people are gonna be disappointed when they're looking up how to suck a goat and they get this stupid estimating book? <laughs> <'Cause>, uh, <laughs> obviously those two life paths maybe are quite different, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I was looking at your website, man, and I was just like, man, some of these things he comes up with are just awesome. <laughs> yeah, so so the, the URL for your website is the D-Y-O-J-O. -O. Yep. Uh, so, that kind of, I know what it means, but I want you to share, how did you come up with that one? What does it mean and how did you come up with that? <laughs> so it's pronounced Diojo. Um, it's Guatemalan. Okay. Because that's my heritage. <clears throat> no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it means the do your own job dojo. Right. And I, I honestly, I don't remember exactly when it came. I think I was managing a group of people um, and I was particularly frustrated with some of the teamwork aspects in our, our organization at large. And um, I can remember having a conversation with my manager at the time. And he said, you know, people just need to trust each other and things would work a lot better around here. And I said, you're right and you're wrong. Right. Like, you can't just say, hey, if you guys would just trust each other, this thing would work better. It's like, well, if we don't trust each other, there's a reason. And I think when it comes down to it, both for you, if you're trying to be and grow your career, or maybe like myself, you're put into your first management position and you don't know what the hell you're doing, right? <laughs> um, what, what your team needs to understand, what you need to understand is just do your job. Like if you, like if you and I are working together, Martin, and maybe we don't quite get along, but if you, if I know you are doing your job to the best of your ability, and you know the same about me, we can work together, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have to like each other, but if right. we both trust, yeah, Martin, Martin's trying to feed his family, he's trying to do a good job, we, we can figure it out, right? Trust will eventually build, but if there's not that initial, or teamwork will eventually build, but if there's not that initial trust, then it's, it's very hard. So I think that's at the core of developing your own career, the core of developing a good team and, and a strong organization is that you know, it's it's actually pretty simple. If everybody just will do their dang job, and a lot of times we get mixed up in, well, this person's not doing this, or this person's not doing this, and we're not taking care of our own area, then it just causes problems because we're we're trying to blame other people and not just focus on what we need to be doing. So, yeah, and that's, then the, yeah that's a really good point, John. That's really good because I think one of the challenges a lot of the professionals have, doesn't matter what skilled trade it is, is sort of that decoupling between levels of respect, right? So you have some, yeah. you'll, have, you'll have a technician or you, an employee, doesn't matter really, and you may not have a lot of respect for them as a, personally, sure. but you can cohabitate the fact that yeah. you may not have personal respect, but you have a respect for their knowledge, right? Yeah, and a, lot of, a lot of people get really hung up on, well, I can't work with a person unless I personally respect them, and they, you know, so, there's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of benefit to decoupling those two, right? Yeah, I think that's what you're getting at. Well, what do they say? Like no like and trust, right? And I think it's probably the wrong sequence. Like it's no trust like, you mm -hmm. know, because like you know exactly like you're saying. I remember I had a conversation with a young man, and he had a uh, this was in carpet cleaning, 
and he had a supervisor or a lead tech that he was paired with for training. And he goes, I can't stand the guy. He's mean. He's rude. You know, da, 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 da. And I, I was like, well, when you get on site with the clients, though, is, is he, does he have it down? Does he have a system down? He goes, yeah, his clients love him. And is he good at what he does? He's probably the best I've ever worked with. Okay, but you don't like him because, you know, you think he's mean or he's rough around the edges. Unfortunately, if any of you listening, I know that's a lot of your audience are getting into the skilled trades. You're, you're going to be paired with some people that are have some sharp edges, right? You know, aren't, aren't the best bedside manner. And, um, and so I said, if you will stick it out for three months or six months with this person, do you think that you'll have a skill set that you can use the rest of your life? They right. said, yeah, probably. And I said, man, I go, I've been where you're at. And that's the moral cal or the mental calculation I had to do is like, if I just shut up, do what this person's telling me to do in six months, you know, I'll never have to work with that person again if I don't want to, you know, because right. I'll have the skills I need. And so, you know, obviously people in leadership were trying to build a better environment in some of those areas. But, you know, they're unfortunately, you know, if you're starting your career out, you know, you have to kind of take the good with the bad and see what people can offer to help you get where you want to go, you know. Right. So, John, you're uh, let, let's let's dig in a little bit to your background. So why don't you share with the audience like uh, what what your background is and, um, you know, how did you kind of end up where you are right now? Sure. Well, I was listening to the episode you did where you share a little bit about your story, right? Where you started in the trades and then you went to school. Right. And then went back in the trades. Yeah. Where, did you go to school for something to supplement what you were doing or were you thinking about trying to make a, a transition? I was actually going to transition into mechanical engineering. That's what that's okay. I'm a mechanical guy. And I, yeah. I thought I was, it was I was one of those guys where, you know, it kind of got drilled into me uh, in school that, you know, if you want to be anything, you've got to get a degree. Hey guys, quick announcement. If you have not stopped into our website at skilltraderescue.com, please do that on the home page here. You will see that we have the join the movement email list. If you haven't signed up, please consider doing that. We have some amazing guests lined up for the podcast. I'm going to be getting the stories out of successful technicians and business owners in skilled trades. These are not just HVAC people. These are going to be people be from across the skilled trade spectrum. And my hope is that I'm going to be able to draw out of these people the things that have worked in their careers amazingly well and the things that if they had a chance to talk to their younger self, what they would tell them not to do. So I want to share all that stuff with you. And if you sign up, you're going to be the first to know when we drop those new podcast episodes. Also, coming soon, we have the BEST workshop. It's a five-day automated email workshop. However, you're going to give content to us through that workshop. You're going to get one-on-one -on -one feedback from our instructors, instructors, and we're looking to better your career. Uh, I've been teaching the BEST process for many, many years, about two decades one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm going to be trying to do that uh, to the masses through this workshop. It's totally free. All you got to do is sign up, and as soon as you do that, you'll get alerts on your email as soon as these new podcasts come in as well as the BEST workshop. So I hope you check it out. I will put a link to the website on the show notes for this episode today. So check it out. Right. Okay. And you know, that's, I'm, that's my age demographic, right? So yeah. I, I, like I said, I, I told you, I, I did everything in reverse. I went into the trades, loved it. Yeah. But I thought that would be a next logical step would meet it to uh, do mechanical engineering. Turns I out I did. Yeah, I didn't go that way altogether. I stayed uh, in, in one way or the other. I stayed in in the trades. <laughs> yeah. Was your was your family previously in the trades or or how did you get into HVAC? No, my dad uh, was a, he owned a Schwinn bicycle dealership. No and, kidding. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I grew up in the bike business, and um, okay. so and I I was getting ready to graduate high school. I was in my automotive uh, shop class. And this guy came in from this uh, HVAC, actually it was an automotive diesel school in, um, in Arizona, Universal Tech. And he spent, you know, pretty much the whole period uh, of the class talking about automotive diesel. And at the very end, they said, by the way, we also offer this uh, heating, air conditioning, refrigeration course, right? 
and uh, yeah, so I that that's that that I I checked into it. And next thing you know, I was on my way to Arizona. <laughs> for um, that's awesome. For so HP, I think... hey, I lost your video feed, bud. The video's gone. Okay, yeah. I think my internet might be acting up. Let me. Oh let yeah. Me... We can continue on it. We can, you know. Here we go. Back. Very Boom. He's back. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I uh, I just decided that uh, I was going to go off to HVAC school, and that's what I did. Dang. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. okay. Yeah. I, uh, I my uncle was a contractor, and so I grew up in and around the skilled trades, and um, like every year. Um, in the summer, I would go, I, I grew up in Washington, so um, I was on Eastern Washington to come to Western Washington, and we'd clean up construction sites and those kinds of things. So I was kind of knew I'd like to be in the skilled trades. I love construction. And as we grew up and got older, we got more and more responsibilities. We built fences and decks and those kinds of things. And um, so I think, uh, but when I got out of high school, I went down to California and I thought I was going to go into law enforcement. I think we were talking a little bit offline. There was a college uh, or down there college for residents. I can't remember. If it was like eight bucks a credit or something like that. So I didn't 100% know what I wanted to do, but I knew like, man, even if I don't use this, I'd be a fool not to get it at right. this rate. Because even in Washington for residents, it was at least triple that, you know. Right. And right. So, so I embarked on that. I had answered an ad or I guess – I've been working in a cabinet shop and loved it. Uh, my, we got married, my wife got pregnant, so I wanted to work closer to home and not have the commute. And I got one of the worst jobs I've ever had. And so I was applying to anything and everything. There's an ad for carpet cleaning at a local service master. Mm -hmm. And I applied to that, went in for the interview. <laughs> and they said, you know, with your background in science, because I'm studying um, law enforcement or criminal justice, they said, you'd be really good at this new thing we're doing called mold remediation. And I was like, yeah, I think you're right. I think I would be really good at that. <laughs> yeah. Not knowing what the heck it was, you know? And so um, anyway, so I got started in that. I did pretty well. You know, here's a little career tip for anybody out there. I could do the paperwork, you know, to where my supervisor could read what we had done for the day so they could properly bill for it. And um, that got me noticed, <laughs> you know, yeah. just, there's yeah. a lot to that, right? Yep. yep. <laughs> just shut up, do what they ask you to do and fill your paperwork out so somebody can read it. Because uh, as in most industries, like in ours in particular, we yeah. work with insurance companies. Like the paperwork is how we get paid. They don't right. pay in our industry for what we actually do. They pay for what we document. And I'm sure it's the same in most, you know, filling yeah. out those tickets or a lot of it's on apps now. You know, catching every little detail, that's that's how your company gets paid so that there's money in the pot for raises and all those kinds of things, you know. So, um, so yeah, that was – I got noticed. I started getting offered opportunities for management and stuff like that, and I said, no, I'm, 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 I've told you all I'm going to school. I'm pursuing law enforcement. And kind of unfortunately, what I think slowed it down, ultimately worked out for the better, was the owner said, you know, we, we, we want to continue consider you for management, but – we need like a lifelong commitment, you know, that you're going to stay here for the rest of your life. I was like, well, yeah, right, right. Trying to be honest, like <laughs> I'm going to school to potentially do something different. So I don't want to make a lifelong commitment, you know, and now knowing what I know now, you know, um, you know, that's, that's not the way things work. And there's no like moral obligation to stay in a company for the rest of your life, you know, so. <laughs> it's sort of like a lifetime warranty. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So. So that's kind of that was my introduction into professionally into the skilled trades and and started kind of a management path as well. So, so you did a bunch of different things. So you started out, you know, carpet cleaning, and that kind of morphed into mold remediation, which is you mentioned insurance companies. So um, looking at the book, and I want to jump into this in a few minutes. Um, your uh, the focal point of your career has sort of been around. Uh, property restoration uh, yeah. and things like that, right? Let's talk talk yeah. about that a little bit. So, like I said, I have the construction background. I knew about building houses. knew uh, I I wasn't skilled in it. I knew of it. I had some skills. I worked in this cabinet shop. We made 
closet organizers and um, garage cabinets. So I had some skills there. I answered the ad for carpet cleaning, but I, I never went to the carpet cleaning division. Um, I went into mold remediation, which if anybody doesn't know, that's the guys that suit up, kind of like asbestos abatement. You know, you put the suits yeah. on, you got the air scrubbers and you're ripping walls out and, and those kinds of things. So when I was there, <clears throat> That we had a we had a water division, people that dealt with water damage in houses and businesses, fire damage, we had contents, we had the mold, and we had a reconstruction division. We did have a carpet cleaning division. Well, the water guys, you know, because those come in any time of the day, right? They got a bunch of overtime, you know. So I'm like, what are the, what are those guys doing? And they're like, well, they're on on call because they answered the water damages, and so you go on call for a week, and it was like you get 20 bucks, and then it goes 10 bucks every. Plus you get your overtime rate and you know young guy starting a family living in california i was like i need that you know what is that hey guys i have an exciting announcement we just recently made some updates to our three most popular online courses at processchilleracademy.com if you're a technician that's looking to improve your skills a little bit maybe get some specialized training to be of more value to your customers and your employer or if you are an employer, a contractor that is looking to augment your existing in-house training with online training that can be accessible from any device, this is a really great opportunity. Just go to processchilleracademy.com, just scroll down on the home page and you will see the course area. If you go into the course page, you will see that we are currently for a limited time, we have a promo code of Chiller Pro that will save you 25% on any one of these courses. So I hope you check it out and I'm looking forward to seeing you in class. And so I got some water damage training and got on the on-call schedule. And you know, for, for those of you that aren't aware, you know, your salary is great, but when you can make overtime, that's when you're starting to make some put away money or some fun money. And uh, or, you know what, John? You exercise something that I, I I call keeping your antenna up. Yeah. You know, uh, there, there's I see this a lot in skilled trades where you know you you know you're you're doing different things. You've been you figured out a way to be proficient to the point where you're getting you know people's attention. And yeah. um, one of the things that you're you're doing, what I call keeping your antennas up, is that. You're always looking out there for uh, for things to make your career more exciting and yeah. more ben more beneficial, right? So yeah. And what what I I see and I'm working on this in my little ebook I'm working on right now is is um, I call what I call the uh, the opposite of that is called the the coaster syndrome, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and what that what that's about is you know people just kind of get stuck in their groove and you can do this both professionally and personally where you just you're in a groove yeah. and then that groove becomes a habit and then that habit gets really difficult to break so that antenna goes down and you may yeah. have you may have some amazing opportunities cross your path that you just like whatever you know that you don't even yeah. think of, right yeah 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 I think that's you know uh, a friend of mine that wrote a book called it's called unqualified success and it's kind of mentally getting over that hurdle of thinking like well i don't know how to do that and it's like i think a lot of people similar to what you're talking about that we interview um for our podcast that there's a common thread where i don't think it's like ego or pride where they're saying you know oh, i can do anything they're just there's a kind of a confidence like i'm sure i could figure that out right like you know i don't know anything about hvac I'm sure if I work with you, I could figure it out, right? It isn't rocket science. You know, it, it takes time and dedication. And the right. same, if you came over into our industry, the things that have made you good at what you do would translate, you know, because you would figure it out, right? Um, and early on, the driver for me was, you know, I got mouths to feed, you know. <laughs> so oh, any oh, any oh, opportunity, oh. yep, yep, any yeah. opportunity yeah. to make a couple extra dollars, you know, um, is, is huge. And cost of living is just skyrocketing right so you know the that's the beautiful thing about skilled trades like if you wanted to work 24 hours a day you could you know that's not sustainable long term but when you're young and if you could be smart enough to put a little bit of that away you know you'll you'll set yourself up really well you know but yeah, yeah. i like that keeping your antennas up yeah hey so i want to pivot over into estimating so okay. uh, i um 
I, I went through your book. I did not get a chance to read the entire thing cover to cover, but uh, there's some really, really great takeaways in there. Um, so uh, it, John, John wrote a book recently on, um, on estimating, and I just want to tell you from my personal experience, for those of you technicians out there that are seriously considering starting a business, doesn't matter yeah. if it's a plumber, electrician, doesn't matter, skilled trade business, you want to get into it, you've been doing it for a few years. I'm here to tell you that unless you know, if, if to coin John's term, if you suck at estimating, <laughs> you're probably not going to be in business very long because uh, that is probably uh, uh, a training gap that you cannot yeah. you cannot succeed without uh, without filling with knowledge is the area of estimating. If unless you know what your what your costs are, what your overhead is, um, so I want you to speak to that, John. How did you decide to write this book? What were the needs that you were trying to fulfill with this thing? Um, well, kind of like you're talking about, I, I've always wanted to write a book, <clears throat> and then I felt like um, there's a period like you know, what What do I know, what I really have to offer? And that same friend, Rachel Stewart, that wrote Unqualified Success, I was on a call with her, and I said, I want to write a book, I just don't know yet what I bring to the table that's unique or, or different. <laughs> and she said, uh, she goes, there are no new ideas. There's nothing unique, right? It's just, it's the same thing. What's unique, you know, in the books that you're going to write, right, Martin, is your perspective, your experience, um, and I, I really gravitate towards that. I, I really hate books full of platitudes that just regurgitate the same thing. And it's like, you know, uh, real popular right now is Gary V, right? Well, that's great. Gary V says whatever Gary V says. But if all you do is regurgitate what Gary V says, I should just go listen to Gary V. Like, right. what's interesting to me is, okay, well, what did Gary V say that you think is interesting? And how did you apply that, 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 that made something successful? That's interesting, right? So, anyways, I wrote this article... I think it was back in 2018, it was called the um, 10 Commandments of Exactimate Estimating Success. Mm -hmm. So in our industry, there's an estimating software, almost every, every industry has some kind of estimating software, right? right? Right. In our industry, it's called Exactimate, and it's the one that, for all intents and purposes, makes a, a common language between us and the insurance companies. It helps to, it's supposed to help in that regard. And so, you know, it's got its nuances and it's got its pros and cons. And uh, so that article, I submitted it to one of our trade magazines and it was, I don't remember, top three for the year. And it kind of clicked. It was like, okay, this this is resonating with people or, or hitting a note or providing some value. So I wrote, that was my first book. Um, but this last one, I'm actually working on, similar to what you're working on, is a course through uh, an outlet called Restoration Technical Institute and so I had to decide, was I going to just make the course around the original book, rewrite the book, edit it? And so this last book was kind of going through that process of um, rethinking, seeing if I would tweak some things, and then trying to be a little bit more practical. That first book was more kind of mindset and habits. Mm -hmm. This one still is a lot of mindset and habits, but tries to dive a little deeper into some of the actual principles that will help. And I, I think it does, like you're saying, it's very specific to our industry, but there's a lot of things in there that translate to any industry. Yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the things I took away from your book is, okay, so so what? Everybody has their own computer program to put the data yeah. into, right? Yeah. That's all fine and good, but anything to do with computer software, whatever your output product is for a final yeah. number on a job, it's the old garbage in, garbage out principle, right? Yes. You know, so, so if you're putting in garbage, you're going to get yep. garbage out. Yep. And I was looking on uh, on page 19 here. You say um, in either scenario, an estimator, you as an estimator, you must focus on those items that are within your control. For example, did I thoroughly capture the condition uh, for the work site? Right. That's huge. Yeah. That's yeah. huge because every every work site's different, and that's not necessarily how to use a piece of software. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's learning how to how to look how to get your your view of what's happening. Uh, did we, I, we call it telling the, 
Mm -hmm. Sorry, we, we call it telling the story of the loss. Right? Yeah. I'm sure that translates to even what you do, tell the story of what you're trying to do. Yeah, anyway, there, there's a bunch of great stuff on that in that area. And then the other, the other area that stood out to me is, you know, we're all using cameras now, right? We're yep. all using uh, cameras to capture, you know, images of a job site, but there's a there's a right and a wrong way to do that. So you you know you get into some some details as to how to properly capture a focal point of of what it is you, that you got to document, right? In your particular yep. case, I guess it's really tough dealing with insurance companies because you're going to have some claims adjusters that really know what they're doing, representing yep. the insurance company, and you're going to yep. have some that don't know a darn thing. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, so Similar to architects, engineers, and you know, yeah. uh, facilities managers, and everybody else, right? There's yeah. there's a handful of people that are a joy to work with, and a handful of people that are just like you. You have a job, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I well, we could talk for hours about that. All right, so back to your book. Yeah. So, um, who's the audience for this? I, I uh, who's your best audience for your your new book? Um. Well, I tried to write it. I, I tried to weave in. Um, I, I think I said four main points, but like the the person that is an aspiring professional that's trying to grow their career, I think there's plenty of material in there. Like in our field, it would be the technician that says, you know, is thinking, should I stick with this? Is there even an opportunity? You know, you're doing all the grunt work and the gross work, right? Is there an opportunity to stick here and actually make a career for myself? Mm -hmm. So I'd love for those people like that that are in the industry and any of the skilled trades to read it and think like, okay, you know, I can, I don't, you don't have to be the smartest, the fastest, you know, the richest, like you can figure this out. You know, you just, you're going to need to master what you're doing now and then try to, to step up with it. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the other, I think there's a huge gap in <clears throat> like people like myself, you have some proficiency in the field. And so someone recognizes that and puts you in a leadership role and then expects that immediately those skills that made you successful in the field will make you successful as a manager. And they're completely different, right? Because when I'm in the field, I'm only responsible for myself and maybe my immediate team. But once you become a management role, your success and responsibility now is to make everybody else better. And that's a completely different skill set. 100% mm -hmm. can be learned, but it, it's very, very different. Right. Um, and especially learning, you know, this person doesn't learn the same way I did. You know, everybody's got a different learning style. Everybody has a different, you know. So yeah. I think there's, I try to think about those type of people that are put into a management role, maybe didn't get a lot of training or support. And not necessarily because the organization is organization's bad, just everybody's busy, right? So we think we're training people and setting them up for success. And a lot of times there's gaps there. And then the third would be like the business owner that wants, I think most business owners, if they read this, there's a lot that they're like, I've been saying that for years, you know, exactly. But just sometimes a different voice saying it can get it across, you know, maybe hit a little bit differently. And so yeah. I think it's a book that any restoration owner, any skilled trades owner could hand to either an aspiring professional that wants to grow their career and say, hey, there's, there's some tips in here that are the roadmap to success. Mm -hmm. And then also, obviously, estimators any estimators it would help them and then people you know in management roles i think it would help them as well so but it's it's probably the core would be anybody looking to better themselves and grow professionally you know there's going to be something in there that i think you'll take away it's designed around like six key tools that uh you should be able to take away and implement immediately yeah you're break yeah I'm, you're breaking those into modules you call them yep Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's good. You know, you brought up one thing that I think um, you touch on in here is uh, actually you, know, you get into a lot of depth, actually, how to collecting information from the job site. We talked about that a few minutes ago. Um, the trick is, is that a lot of times skilled trades people, let's say, let's pick a plumber. All right. Okay. You know, you've got a, an older house. And for some reason, you know, the old copper pipes are just done or they've got old steel pipes or whatever. And the, the house is going to need a, a major repipe. And I'm just creating yeah. that off the top of my head. All right. So usually the first responder to that is the technician showing up there 
Yeah. Uh, and he's dealing with, you know, uh, a water pipe breaking under the house or whatever. And then he yeah. digs into it a little bit further and finds out that, uh, wow, uh, this pipe is toast and it really, yeah. we need to do some major work. Anyway, so. Where am I going to tie in, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all that stuff, right? So yeah. uh, a lot of shops will rely on data coming in from the field to yep. Yep. come up with a budget. I say that in yep. air quotes because um, a lot of companies nowadays, are, they're not really giving hard quotes. They're gonna give you kind of a budget on what it's gonna take yep. to fix this thing. Anyway, so it's uh, the documentation by that first responder is really, really critical. And yep. one of the things that I struggled with as a business owner for years is to try to motivate these guys um, to really pay attention on the detail they're providing on their paperwork, right? So let's talk to that. Do, do you have any ideas for business owners out there on how they can maybe motivate their their first responder technicians <laughs> to do a better job at documenting? Yeah, it's 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 encouraging. It's encouraging, I guess, and discouraging to hear you say that because I know any restoration owners or managers would say, "Amen," right? That's like. Geez, we've we gone over this. I think I even have that scenario in the book. We talk about this all the time, you know. And um, I think, I think number one, managers, owners, we do have to take a hard look and say, are you holding people to a higher standard than you're holding yourself to? Because right. in our industry, say that that plumbing tech goes out there, right? So the call comes in, hey, we got low water pressure, right? Okay, so what does that technician get? He gets a piece of paper, maybe a text that says, go to this house, they have low water pressure, right? And then you're mad when they come back and say, yeah, the pipes are bad, right? right. They gave you the same amount of information that you gave them. Right. So your right. habits as a company is you don't give a shit about detailed documentation when it goes to them, but they better have detailed documentation when they come back. That's right. backwards. Yeah. So w where that starts is when that call comes in and it doesn't matter if it's the owner, the estimator, the technician, whoever answers the call should have some some form of a script that says, OK, can you tell me a little bit more about that? When mm -hmm. did you notice this? You know, are your are your toilets flushing? You know, is there, you know, crud in the water? You know, so like on our side, it would be, oh, you have a water damage. You know, do you know where it started? Yeah, it was the laundry sink. You know, has the plumber been out and shut the water off? No, there's still water gushing out of the wall. Okay, get off the phone, call a plumber, and then call us back, you know. And if you need a plumber, these are the three we recommend or whatever. You right. know? So I think you have to take a hard look and say, are you expecting something? Because your habits say more than, you know, what you do says more than what you say, right? So your 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 people are going to emulate. So if, if you can say, man, we give you, you have copious amounts of details, you know as much as humanly possible when you get there, isn't that nice? Yes, okay, right. we need the same from you. The other side to that is I think cross-training is really important. Like okay. your office person should go out in the field, right? Your estimator should crawl under houses at least once a year and remember what that's like. Um, and your technicians, it's easier, way easier said than done, you know, to take a technician out of the field and put them in the office, but when they do, they see like, man, you guys aren't just sitting in air conditioning, you know, <laughs> eating Cheetos, you know, like your day is pop, 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 pop. So yeah. I, think, yeah. I think that's another way to, people don't always understand that what I do affects other people. And when it's put that way, then it creates a different perspective. Um, yeah. So I know there's a lot of incentive programs and things like that. Ultimately, I think those are cumbersome and hard to, to follow. It takes a lot of management, man. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one one company I know does kind of like a quarterly, and they usually take like one focus. And so they're saying, hey, we need uh, maybe we need Google reviews this month. So whoever gets the most Google reviews gets this cool prize, right? <laughs> and it's not a $25 gift card to Starbucks. It's like a Traeger barbecue or something, right? You know, mm -hmm. if you're gonna do kind of some kind of incentive, make it short term and make it like really impactful. Um, but uh, but ultimately, I think a lot of it just comes down to clarity, consistency, and then accountability. We always focus on wanting accountability, but we don't always ensure that it's clear and that everybody's following it. Because like 
if the estimators don't have to follow it, it's not a policy, right? It's just right. A, you guys have to do it. And so I think a lot of times it's it's inconsistency or a lack of clarity. There's ultimately at the root of some of those lack of performance issues. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I used to I used to run about twice a year. I would run a, uh, a course. I think I called it uh, service technician accounting or something like that. Okay. And we, I started the course out with uh, just a quick question: um, How much how much profit does the company make on yeah. your time? Right. So at the time, I can't remember now, you know, I'm just picking a number from the air, but I think we were charging, you know, 80 bucks an hour for our commercial clients that had contracts. And my top technicians were making 25, 26 bucks an hour. Sure. And it was really interesting because my newbies didn't, they hadn't taken this class before. I would ask them, well, how much, how much does the company make and profit? Yeah, and I'd say 70% of them actually thought that the difference between what I charge the customer and what I pay them was all profit. Oh, okay. Yep, yep, yep. yep. So, so then what was really fun about that was then I get into the numbers, I get into the overhead, and I get in, you know, without getting too off the rails, just I just basically kind of covered what they needed to know. Yeah. And then I would then I would pivot over into. Uh, paperwork yep. because what once they understood what the overhead was then yeah. I was able to have that conversation with them about okay so let's create a scenario here our plumber again and that technician does a crappy job at just like you said the information yeah uh, coming back from the field was no better than we got when the when the service call came in so yeah. what do I got to do so I have to send an estimator over there, or I have to send another technician out there with more experience or whatever, pay him. And the customer, yep. by the way, is not going to pay again to yep. have another tech. So I'm paying for that. So that, so then I, you know, I work the snare all the way down. So basically what ends up happening on that first visit, we lost money yep. because, because yep. of, you know, and, and once again, you have to keep it simple. You can't get over complicated. I get approached from time to time from people looking for process chillers. And as the cliche goes, I know some guys. And those guys are Andy and Paul over at G&D Chillers. If you're an end user, an OEM, or a reseller, and you're looking for a quality chiller to be designed and built, Andy and Paul are the go-to guys for the chiller pros out there. G&D has been designing and building chillers for over 25 years. And besides knowing what they're doing, they're honest and they go over and above to treat their customers right. So if you find yourself in need of a process chiller, call G&D at 800-555-0973. Make sure to ask for Andy or Paul and use the promo code CHILLERPRO so they know that you're one of our listeners. I love one of their taglines too. It says that they're big enough to produce and small enough to care. And that's the for sure G&D. Again, call G&D Chillers, ask for Andy or Paul, use promo code CHILLERPRO, 800-555-0973, or check them out online at gdchillers.com forward slash CHILLERPRO. What was interesting was uh, I made a connection between me not making a profit and the ability to pay my service technicians. Yeah. Well, the ability to give my technicians a raise. Raise. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Or all that new vans. Yeah. 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 New vans. All that stuff. And once they were able to make that, you know, some of them were just hopeless. I mean, they, they didn't care. Yeah. But I'd yeah. say, you know, I was able to get through to maybe thirty percent of them, and just by giving them a little education about the the finances of a contracting company, I, I started seeing improvements. Yeah. And um, anyway, so I, I just I probably went off on a tangent there. But <laughs> I think that's huge, though, because, again, that's um, – we talk about – I think it's like a leadership download, right? Like you started the company, right? Like, hey, guys, I started this company. It was just me. I was the one it doing was. everything, right? Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so it, it's important for people to know this is why I started the company. This is why we do the things that we do. And I think a lot of times – I think that goes to the clarity is just reminding people. I think the clarity is the whole team hearing from you as the owner – you know, the, the one that started the company, the consistency is as you start to let, add layers of management, making sure they're 
communicating and, and managing the way that you envision that to happen because it, it can get away from you, right? When you start a company and you have these layers, you, if you're not hands-on uh, and checking in, you don't know if the managers are implementing the way that you want it or just doing what they learned from whatever company they came from. Right. Um, but I think I think exposing them to that is really key. I, would you agree with this? I, I think I call it the Diojo chart. And what I try, technicians need to understand, everybody in the company needs to understand, we need two things to be a successful company. And the two things are we need happy customers and we need profitable jobs. We right. need both of those things, neither to the exclusion. Um, so like what you're talking about is helping them understand what it takes to be profitable. But I think ultimately what the technician can control and what they should focus on is I want you when you're in the field to focus on making that customer happy. Mm -hmm. Because if you make them happy and say we lag in profits for a little bit, we can figure that part out. You know, we can track it, we can figure it out. But if you focus on profits and we don't have happy customers, it's harder to fix it in the reverse, you know? Right. And so right. I, I think exactly like you're saying, it's important for them to have kind of a broad understanding. You're not pocketing $60 on the 80, you know, <laughs> is, is really important for them to understand. Um, but not every technician knows or cares, you know, like all of the details, but it, it is important for them to know from a broader perspective, you know? Yeah. Martin's not just, every time I go out, just, you know, it doesn't go directly in his wallet. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a you know, where are they going to learn it? They're not going to yeah. learn that in tech school, you know, yep. and, and they yep. definitely didn't learn that in high school or whatever. Yeah. So, um, I want to talk about I want to talk about uh, drill into your book here a little bit. Uh, you get into a section at the very end called budgeting. Okay. Um, and I thought that was intriguing um, because. You know, after all the science and all the software and everything, sometimes um, you, you get into being able to, uh, what I got out of it was, you know, looking at a job and being able to come up with, you know, cost per square foot or, you know, you, you, you're, I, I guess you could call them kind of shortcuts, but I, yeah. I, I would call them informed shortcuts. Yep. And um, one of the things I, I found is, but, uh, budget or shortcuts, if you will, as far as cost per square foot or, you know, when it comes to HVAC, you know, cost per linear foot of flex duct, eight inch, you know, there's there's yep. all these kind of tables out there that you can get, and you know, especially flat raters. I don't know if, if you work with a lot of contractors, but there's a lot of flat raters out there where, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, the owner or the estimator will say, okay, you got 1,500 square foot house. The flat rate is so many dollars per square foot to to put in an, an HVAC system, for example. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So those can be very helpful, but um, yeah, I want to. What What do you think about budgeting? Uh, in other words, coming up with shortcuts like that. What's your opinion about that stuff? Well, I think you, uh, first of all, you mentioned um, like say somebody that's thinking about starting their own business, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we see so many people. I'm making $25 an hour. I'm going to start my own business, and guess what I'm going to pay myself? 30 <laughs> bucks an hour, right? And then so, so you're like, wow, wow, you're making five bucks more an hour. That's awesome. That's great. How much are you charging the customer? 30 bucks an hour. You know, <laughs> it's like, wait, oh, man. What? You know, you're, you're now making a lot less than you ever made, you know, and especially when it comes time to pay your taxes, you're going to have a, a, a real uh, so, rude awakening rude awakening it's important whatever system you use the core of all your costing is what are your hard costs right like and your hard costs are say in hvac you know i've got 300 linear feet of ducting it's going to cost what x at whatever the market rate is for just the materials i got the hangers the screws you know the tape and all that and then you know that's going to take a, two guys eight hours right so that's that's your hard costs um now your overhead costs are that van, the fuel, the office, all those kind of things are a percentage of that. And then your profit is what you're trying to put away at the end of the year so you can invest in things and and and, and go. And I think people need to understand, even in the trades, even estimators that have been doing it for years, 
that overhead is necessary. It's not like a fluff number, like, right. you know, Martin made this up so that he could, you know, have it. Like, those are real costs. And if you don't pay the electric bill, you know, you don't have a company, you don't pay your licensing, you don't pay your taxes. Um, and so, so I think, especially at the estimator level, you have to have an understanding of what the overhead is. Um, mm -hmm. And, but a lot of that comes down to, like you said, with that um, square footage pricing or the flat rate, you just need to understand the, uh, I, I'm assuming in the flat rate scenario, we have that like in carpet cleaning and stuff like that. You know, th those companies are playing a volume game, right? So what's most important to them is get a job, get it done and get another job. You know, right. that's that's what they're gonna want you to focus on. Budgeting may not be as important because it's it's just a number, right? You just crap right. the number in and, and go. Um, you, you, gotta, you, have do, to be, you have to be careful about it, you know, so I, I think books like yours that you've got um, cover the fundamentals and well, I guess my argument is you don't want to start budgeting or, or as guesstimating, if you will, based on flat numbers until you've got a fundamental understanding of yes. everything, right? Yep. So yep. Um, don't think you're smarter than the the numbers and um, you know don't just take a you know don't don't take somebody's guidance on what a, on a budget number is going to be uh, until you prove it out yourself you know yeah. that particular yeah. uh, cost per whatever you know whatever the unit Accurate. is actually uh, actually works under your overhead structure yeah right? yeah yeah because you know yeah. the cost per square foot that that you're bidding that you heard from, you know, one of your buddies at a mix group or something like that down the road, that may be yeah. based on his overhead, and he yeah. may not be paying himself anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. You just like you were just saying. So, if if you you got to make sure you know your numbers, and I think that's why books like you've got here, um, I think are so powerful because it it, it forces you to think about a lot of the details. Yeah. Well, you should you should be building a budget as you're estimating, right? Like, you know, okay, I think the, I'm assuming every every estimate has assumptions. So I'm assuming this is two guys, eight hours at what our rates are. I'm assuming it's this amount of materials and then the overhead and the profit should be, you know, coming from the company. Mm -hmm. uh, on the reverse of that though, I can remember when I started my company, I had this deck and I bid it out and I had an old guy helping me um, that also had a business and uh, was really good at decks. And I said, man, I didn't charge enough for this job. And he goes, well, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, we're over hours, we're over materials, da, 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 da. I, I need to ask them for more money. And he, he grabs me by the shirt and pulls me behind the shed and he goes, it's not their fault that you're a bad estimator. <laughs> He's like, get the job done. <laughs> and I, um, you can imagine he probably it was a lot more colorful than that. But um, yeah, you know, maybe that that's was, where it came. So how not to suck? Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but that was an important lesson. It's not if you if you mess up, you need to honor what you said and uh, yeah. and 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 be better next time. You know. So yeah. Hey, so. <laughs> Before we wrap up, I want to talk about some of your other publications. I'm I'm uh, got your website open here. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah, so let's talk about some of your other stuff here. You've got a whole bunch of things. Uh, what what are? Let's talk about some of your other documents, the other books you have out there. So you have this is your second. Uh, this is your second estimating book, right? Uh, yes. This is sort of yep. a, a Rev two or yeah. two point oh. <laughs> yep. Uh, that, I think that'd be accurate. Yeah, the first the first book was Be Intentional Estimating, Mindset and Habits for Success. Okay. Uh, and that's designed if you want to get into estimating or if you're teaching people estimating, you know, a manager of estimators. That's kind of what that's designed for. I wrote one, Be Intentional Culture. This mm. is actually with several other authors. And the idea was there how the small things enhance or undermine your culture. So I asked people to share you know, one small thing that helped them actually improve their culture and then maybe a lesson that we're like, I tried that and it really failed. <laughs> to kind of share personal stories. And then the last one uh, was, so you want to be a project manager? Um, and that's 
again, designed for people that want to get into project management or people managing project managers goes into, in our industry, project management and estimating kind of, there's a lot of overlap, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, there's, there's things in there that are probably more estimating than project management and vice versa. Well, to, and you could have a spot on perfect uh, estimate system, yeah. right? And then yep. have poor project management Yep. And there you go. There goes your profit, right? Yep. Yep. Or vice versa. You or know, you got versa. Project, project managers that are aces, but they keep getting handed, you know, BS scopes, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. So, hey, John, how can, um, so, so people can buy your books directly from the website? How, how do they um, read you? Uh, do you do, uh, do you do webinars or do you do um, workshops and things like that? So probably the best way to get the books is on Amazon. Um, okay. They're, they're ready. If if somebody wanted to buy a bulk order for like their whole office, um, that's probably where it would make sense to reach out. We can do a bit of a discount or sign copies, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, I am working on with this book in particular, a course that'll be available through Restoration Technical Institute. Okay. Um, and then um, I do a podcast uh, we usually release ours on Thursdays, the DOJ yeah. podcast. So that is it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I very much look forward to continuing to connect with you. Please don't hesitate to send me messages on LinkedIn. I'm on there all the time. Or you can reach out to me uh, on my email. I'm at mking at processchilleracademy.com. And until next week, uh, when I give you the next installment, I uh, wish you a great week, and I will connect up with you again soon. Take care now. Bye-bye.